the station of Macuston, that far off corner of the strange country of the Yukon, where the eight months of winter are so terrible, but the short summer so marvelously beautiful was on four occasions my chosen retreat during the eight years that I've known the North. A friend of mine in San Francisco, Mr. Butler, who had come to Dawson City in order to purchase gold mining concessions, had promised to join me to go hunting together. I was taking my coffee one afternoon in the veranda of Father Levenick's cabin when all at once I heard someone whistle from the farther bank of the river. I saw a bark canoe, paddled by two Indians, was coming up the river in the shadows of the trees. Butler was with them. My dear fellow, he said, smiling as I met him, and endeavoring to hide his visible agitation. I have something very strange to tell you, said Butler. Do you know that Prehistoric monsters still exist. Huh? I broke out laughing, and together we returned by the little path which led to the father's house. When Butler had taken off his muddy boots and was settled in a comfortable seat, he began to recount his story as follows. Traveling was frightfully bad, 40 miles of marshy country, at last, at nightfall, I descended a hill and had the pleasure of seeing Grant's cabin. Grant was at home, and a good supper was waiting for me. Early next morning, which was yesterday, he came to tell me that three fine moose were feeding quietly behind the plateau of Partridge Creek. After swallowing a hasty mouthful, all four of us, Grant, your two men and I, started out from the hut. We made a wide detour at the top of a hill where we had hidden ourselves, all of us, stretched full length on the ground. We perceived then a short distance off in the valley near Moose Lake, three enormous moose moving forward and quietly browsing on the moss and lichens. All at once, they gave three simultaneous bounds, and one of the males gave vent to the striking bellow which these animals utter only when they are hunted or mortally wounded. The three went off at a mad gallop towards the sound. What happened, I thought. We decided to approach the spot and arriving at the moose lake, we saw the fresh imprint of the body of a monstrous animal. Its belly had made an impression in the slime estimated to be more than two feet deep, thirty feet long, and twelve feet wide. Four gigantic paws also deeply impressed at each end of the main imprint, and a little to the side, footprints five feet long by two and a half feet wide. The claws being more than a foot long, the sharp points which had buried themselves deeply in the mud. There was also the print, apparently, of a heavy tail, ten feet long and sixteen inches wide at the point. We decided to follow the tracks of the monster in the valley for five or six miles, and then at the ravine of Partridge Creek, a place which the miners call a gulch, they disappeared as if by enchantment. The next morning, after listening to my friend Butler, at five o'clock in the morning, Father Levenix, Butler, Limo, and a neighboring miner hastily summoned myself and five men of the tribe crossed the river steward in two canoes. Neither of the first two guides, who were overcome with terror, nor the sergeant of the mounted police who received our story with skepticism, nor the letter carrier, will consent to accompany us. All day long we searched for the monster, without result. The valley of the little river McQuiston, the flats of Partridge Creek, 
and the country between Balo and the lofty snow-covered mountains. Nothing. At last, towards evening, tired out, after having toiled for a long time through the great marsh, we lighted a fire at the top of a rocky ravine. The sun was setting. Lying by the fire, we let our eyes wander over the littering expanse of the marsh which we had just traversed. The tea was boiling, and everyone was preparing to dip his tin cup into the pot when suddenly a noise of rolling stones and a strange, harsh, and frightful roar made all of us spring to our feet. The beast for which we had been looking, a black, gigantic form, the corners of his mouth filled with blood-stained slime, his jaws munching something, I know not what, was slowly and heavily climbing the opposite side of the ravine, making the large boulders roll into the valley as he went. Struck with terror, Father Levenix, Limo and myself tried to utter a cry of fright, but no sound issued from our parched throats. Unconsciously, we had seized each other's arms. The five Indians were crouching down with their faces against the ground, trembling like leaves shaken by the wind. Butler, Butler was already rushing down the hill. The dinosaurs, it's the dinosaurs of the Arctic Circle, muttered Father Levenux with chattering teeth. The monster had stopped scarcely twenty paces away from us, and resting upon his huge belly, was staring motionless at the red sun which was bathing all the landscape in a weird light. For a full ten minutes, riveted to the spot by some strange force which we could not overcome did we contemplate this terrible apparition. We were, however, in full possession of all our senses. There was not and never will be in our minds the least doubt as to the reality of what we saw. It was indeed a living creature, and not an illusion which we had before us. The dinosaurus then turned his immense neck, but did not seem to see us. His withers were at least 18 feet above the ground. His entire body, from the extremity of his yawning jaws, which was surmounted by a horn like that of a rhinoceros, to the end, of the tail must have measured at least 50 feet. His height was like that of a wild boar, garnished with thick bristles in color of grayish black. His belly was plastered with thick mud. At this moment, Butler returned to us. He told us he thought the animal weighed about 30 tons. Suddenly, the dinosaurus moved his jaws, visibly chewing some thick, viscid kind of food, and we heard a sound like that of the crunching of small bones. Then, with a sudden movement, he raised himself on his hind legs and giving utterance to a raw, hollow, indescribable, frightful sound and wheeling round with surprising agility. With moments resembling those of a kangaroo, he sprang with a prodigious bound into the ravine. On the 24th, Butler and myself, having taken two days rest, started out for Dawson City for the purpose of demanding from the governor 50 armed men and mules. Huh. My friends, here my story ends, because for a month we were the laughing stock of the golden city.